Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for choosing to spend some time with me here today. Uh, my name is Jason Allnut, and this is my presentation on industrial control systems related cybersecurity events and malware, and specifically the five listed here on my, my title slide. Uh, before I begin, I, I feel necessary to say thank you to GrimCon for giving me this opportunity to, to speak with you all today. This is my first chance to uh, present at a cybersecurity conference, uh, and I'm just incredibly uh, grateful and excited to be here. So with that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I studied electrical engineering uh, in college. I did have a, a concentration or a focus in, in power systems. So uh, ICS and infrastructure is, is kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, while I was in college, I, I got a chance to intern at a, a small power plant here in Maryland, uh, which was a wonderful experience and gave me a lot of hands-on uh, experience in the field. Uh, but from there, I went on and became an RF test engineer with the nationally recognized test lab. Uh, and then that led to my current role as a program manager with IEEE. And before I go on any further, I do need to put out the disclaimer that the, the thoughts and perspective and opinions here uh, are solely my own and do not reflect that of IEEE or, or any of my past affiliations. So just want to throw that out there. I'm sure people are used to hearing it, but uh, yeah. So a little bit about this presentation. This is a pet project of mine. I, I'm not a cybersecurity professional. I'm actually an enthusiast and a hobbyist. Uh, and ICS cybersecurity is, is something that really gets me going. And I think there's a lot more people like me. So I made this presentation for electrical engineers uh, who you know, might be in, in the um, industrial sector or work on power systems uh, and, and hear about Black Energy 3 or Triton or uh, Stuxnet, but maybe you haven't had a chance to dive in any further. Uh, so hopefully this can be a little bit of a, a primer on, on those for them. Uh, also, uh, same goes for cybersecurity professionals who aren't in the ICS space, right? Uh, there's a lot of opportunities now, um, a lot of jobs opening up in ICS. So uh, hopefully this presentation can be a, a tool for them. Uh, as well. And then anyone else who will listen. Like I said, I'm a hobbyist, I'm an enthusiast, and I suspect there's other people like me um, who might really appreciate this information and, and sort of the way I've laid it out here, which, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, so what you can expect, uh, I've tried to summarize these, these five malwares and events as best I can. Uh, so there's a slide with some bullet points, there's some images, there's some icons, um, and, and just going to do like a really quick summary of, of each of them. I've also tried to add some additional tidbits and perspective, my own perspective uh, with my background in electrical engineering and, um, and power systems. So uh, hopefully the people appreciate that. Uh, and then just be, um, you know, just helpful tools, right? So I really tried to, to put things in here that people can, you know, come back to if they want to say, oh, which, which, which event was which, who was involved with what, who were the players, what was important about that? or this, uh, so, so I've tried to put in some helpful tools in here. And, and like I said, you'll see more of that as we go ahead uh, through this. So the first uh, event or malware here is Havix. Uh, there's a reason why I started with Havix. It's a little out of place uh, chronologically, uh, but I thought it was a good place to start. And, and again, here, I've tried to put in some images to, to jog people's memory and, and put some, some you know, images with uh, you know, wherever they're gonna store this in their brain. <laughs> Uh, Havocs. Havocs is a malware that included uh, an ICS module, which is why it's considered one of the ICS uh, malwares. It was discovered in 2013. Uh, its, its sole intent, its real intent was, was espionage, um, it, enumeration, uh, discovery. It didn't really have any damaging effects or intent as, as far as I know or as far as my research could tell me. Uh, but yeah, it was solely just to, to give uh, uh, attackers, if you will, uh, insight into OT networks, operational technology networks and environments. Uh, there wasn't really a, a target event, site, country. I did see some reports that say United States and, and Europe were the, were the sole focus. I, I don't know if that's how cooperated that is, uh, but the, the noteworthy thing about uh, Havix is the OPC module, the Open Platform Communication, which is a, a common industrial communication protocol. Uh, I, I'm not very familiar with it myself, but if you participate in any ICS uh, capture the flag events or you know just 
even research this stuff even a little bit, you're going to see OPC quite a bit. Um, and Havix included a module uh, that was able to uh, do an OPC scanner, right, and enumerate uh, OT environments based off of, of this OPC uh, protocol. Some common protocol uh, ports uh, that the scanner looked for, uh, I've highlighted here in this third to last bullet point, uh, port 44818, 105, and 502. Uh, I tried to align those with with common protocols that are you know out there. I, I'm not sure how much how relevant that is, but these are are common ports that industrial manufacturers and vendors use, and so that's what really kind of gives this away as as ICS related. The other interesting part uh, about Havix that I like to point out is the uh, intrusion or distribution or propagation of, of the uh, malware. And so I've put some helpful icons here, but phishing emails, which I think a lot of people are familiar with now, uh, Trojanized software, uh, software with like, you know, like it says, a, a Trojan piece to it, uh, and then watering hole attacks. And watering hole attacks, as I was doing this research, uh, kept coming up as a, as a real interesting part of this. So, you know, the idea is that the attackers monitored websites that uh, industrial engineers, or it, <laughs> not industrial engineers, but engineers in, uh, you know, the power and energy sector or, or in industrial environments would frequent. Uh, they infected those websites so that when the engineers went there, they were downloading malware instead of, you know, whatever they were expecting to download or, or receive. So uh, the last part of, of all of these is I do try to align the attribution. Uh, I know that's a taboo subject, but it, it seemed remiss not to include it because it is well documented in lots of places. So do with that what you want. I'm not gonna pay too much mind to it, but I did include it in uh, my little scorecard here that you can see um, on the right. So with any of these uh, events and malware, uh, it's important to bring up the Purdue uh, model. This is obviously very well known among probably the cybersecurity community, very well known around the ICS cybersecurity community, but you know, electrical engineers probably don't really think about this all that much. Uh, and what this is, the Purdue model, is it, it breaks down the segmentation between you know, corporate, enterprise, IT networks, kind of the traditional IT networks that we all think about uh, with an organization uh, down into the different layers when the you know industrial control engineers you know come into play right your SCADA engineers and your field techs and just all the way down to the devices there in level zero that actually do the work the actuators the sensors the conveyor belts that move and, and whatever else have you uh, so I like to I like to show this because with all of these events and malware uh, they all have a part where you know. Um, a pivot from the IT, the traditional enterprise network into the OT environment took place at some point, right? And so this kind of helps illustrate, you know, how that might happen or, or you know, where that might go. So I hope people appreciate that. Uh, also, I try to include the uh, MITRE ATT&CK ICS framework TTPs for each one of these in a longer uh, version of this presentation. I would try to go into you know, some of these different TTB, some of the more common ones and the common mitigation uh, or remedies for them. Uh, that was some great feedback I got from another person out in the industry to, to always talk about mitigations. But unfortunately, I just, I don't have enough time here today, but I did include this. I, I think it's uh, good visually. Stuxnet. Uh, Stuxnet is the most probably well-known uh, malware uh, talked about whenever you talk about ICS cybersecurity probably don't need to tell anybody here that. Uh, I know a lot of people probably roll their eyes when they hear it because, you know, oh, here we go again. Uh, but as I was doing this project, this was the most exciting part for me because it's just such a dense topic and it's, it, it has no end, <laughs> it feels like, whether you're talking technically or uh, geopolitically or, you know, just down to the, the individual people and their narratives. It's, it's, it's just extremely fascinating. And it really kind of reminded me of another event um, that if you ever go to a power and energy conference, you're absolutely going to hear almost to the same cadence that Stuxnet is. And that's the 2003 Northeastern blackout. Uh, this satellite picture here shows it, you know, is a blackout happened in 2003, uh, spanned all the way from Ohio to New York, down to Maryland, up through Canada. Um, and it's, it's, it's widely 
widely known, widely talked about. It's a great use case. And I think, you know, I wanted to put the 2003 Northeastern Blackout and Stuxnet sort of on a similar plateau, if you will, um, as just wonderful use case examples that uh, there's just endless amount of things to learn from. But what was Stuxnet? It was a, a incredibly complicated malware. Um, it, its target was the Siemens PLCs that eventually controlled the centrifuges uh, for uranium enrichment process uh, in the Tons, Iran. Uh, what usually gets talked about with Stuxnet is the, the four zero days. Uh, and when I was putting this project together, I thought it would be really fun to go and find uh, the actual you know, write-ups uh, of those CVEs on, on NIST's website. And I've included those links here if anyone else is interested. Um, one, one interesting piece that I just can't get over and I always talk about now is that a, actually a fifth zero day was sort of included in the, in the Stuxnet development. Uh, in, a, in an earlier version, and I found that to be incredibly fascinating. Uh, oh, and I should also talk through the scorecard here. So uh, it was discovered in 2010. Its likely intent was to actually break the uranium enrichment process. Uh, the, the target country, obviously Iran, the target site, although not a nuclear power plant, my icon's a little deceiving there, it was the uranium enrichment uh, plant. Uh, noteworthy tech, Windows and Siemens, and the initial intrusion uh, was USB sticks, right? So USB sticks uh, that were infected with the malware left around the site. Eventually those USB sticks got plugged into engineering workstations. The malware then uh, pivoted onto the engineering workstations. Uh, and then eventually uh, because the PLCs, the Siemens PLCs that were the intended target were actually air gapped uh, from you know, the common network, uh, the, the intent and the hope by the attackers was that the engineers would carry the malware on their engineering workstations over the air gap to the PLCs um, and eventually um, you know, the, the end place where the malware was intended to end up. Uh, the malware would then um, uh, plant itself on a PLC um, and then start to control the converters that controlled the speed of the centrifuges. And centrifuges are incredibly delicate, fragile machines. I mean, they're, they're big spinning, uh, machines, but they're they're kind of fragile in nature, uh, and so any kind of manipulation of them can can eventually end up uh, tearing them apart. Uh, attribution is the United States and Israel. That's well documented and talked about, although never confirmed. Um, again, you know, do with that information uh, what you want. So, what I think is lost. Maybe not lost, but you know we're in the day and age of ransomware, right? Uh, ransomware everywhere, and ransomware when it shows up, it's loud and it's noisy, and it, it makes itself known. Hey, I've I've come and I've encrypted your files, <laughs> pay me money. Uh, but Stuxnet and and some of these other uh, uh, malwares, uh, you know, their real crux was their their subtlety, right, and their patience and their ability to sit dormant and wait because you know their their intent is this, to create this destruction but kind of go unnoticed. And that's exactly what Stuxnet was trying to do. And so I tried to put together, this is one of my big brain visual ideas, uh, this, this sort of visual of just how long and over what period the Stuxnet worm operated uh, versus like you know, sitting dormant, right? So once Stuxnet made its way onto one of the PLCs, the Siemens PLCs, it actually sat dormant for 12 or 13 days, did nothing. Uh, well, technically it, it recorded uh, and logged what was going on. But on that 14th day, uh, it would then increase the speed of the centrifuge uh, from, you know, 1,064 hertz to 1,400 hertz uh, for 15 minutes. That's it, for, for 15 minutes. And for that 15 minutes, um, the malware was also able to replay what it had recorded from the previous 13 days and give back to the control center, you know, what was a, a normal reading. Uh, but then after that 15 minutes, it would go back to normal and then it would sit dormant again for 26 days. Uh, and then on the, the 41st day there uh, for 51 minutes, it would decrease the speed uh, from 1064 Hertz down to two Hertz. Uh, from what I understand, it, the centrifuges never actually made it to two Hertz. That would be pretty noticeable if uh, you know something spinning at 1000 Hertz all of a sudden was just started spinning at two Hertz. Uh, but, but the idea was that it would, it would slow down enough uh, during that 50 minutes that it would create damage. Um, and, then, and then after that 50 minutes, go back into a dormant state 
wait 26 days and then repeat the process. And if it hadn't already created the damage in the centrifuge, uh, it you know probably would you know on its next iteration. So you're looking at 65 minutes of manipulation over 67 days. And I, I just think that's just the most fascinating part of Stuxnet uh, that I like to, to tell people, you know, when these things are in your system, they can play the long game. You know, they can play the long con. And, and Stuxnet sure is a, is a great example of that. Again, TTP is much more complicated than Havix, a lot more highlighted here. I, I greatly encourage everybody to, to look these up if you have time. Uh, Black Energy 3. Black Energy 3 and Crash Override are always spoken about in tandem. You'll see why here in a minute, um, but you know, we'll just go right into it. Black Energy 3 is a malware that led to the interruption of, um, of the electrical power in Ukraine for about a quarter of a million people uh, in December of 2015. Its intent was to turn out the lights. Uh, that's an oversimplification, obviously, but I think it uh, kind of describes it pretty well. Um, the target was Ukraine. Uh, the target site was three electric distribution utilities, uh, distribution being the key word there. Uh, and the best word that I learned during this whole project, uh, Obernergos, which is the name for utilities in Ukraine. So that's a fun one to say. Uh, the noteworthy tech is kind of hard to describe because Black Energy 3, although it's considered an ICS malware, uh, the the ICS part of it really came down to the target, which were these utilities, uh, which were targeted through spear phishing campaigns. So, you know, campaigns that were targeting these, these IT personnel at these utilities, um, slightly different than just a, a general phishing campaign. And, uh, and then the manipulation by the attackers once they got a foothold in the system. So uh, the, the malware, the Black Energy 3, uh, created a foothold in the Obernergos. Uh, the attackers were then able to enumerate and investigate, do espionage, um, create some, some changes while they were in there. Um, a couple of things that they did was they uh, reconfigured the uninterruptible power, uninterruptible power supplies uh, for the control rooms, uh, installed kill disk, um, also corrupted some of the firmware for some of the serial to ethernet converters that, that talked from the substation uh, out into the field, or excuse me, the control room to the substations. Uh, and then, you know, on the day of their attack, um, they were able to basically log in, uh, take control, uh, turn some breakers off, uh, create a bunch of havoc uh, when, when, you know, uh, the unerratable power so sources were supposed to turn on. They, they weren't because they were misconfigured. Uh, when power was restored to the control room, the kill disk uh, made the engineering workstations inoperable, or at least some of them. Um, and then even furthermore, uh, the control room wasn't able to communicate out into the field because of the uh, misconfiguration of the firmware of the serial to ethernet converters. So uh, a, a lot going on there. But again, what I want to emphasize is that Black Energy 3 didn't actually have those pieces in it you know, coded into it. Uh, Black Energy 3 created the foothold and then uh, it was actual manipulation by the attackers to, to uh, execute the, the, the attack. Again, it was attributed to uh, Russia and, and the, the APT group Sandworm. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next one. Uh, the TTPs here, uh, much more scarce. I'm not really sure why. I, I just collected this information from MITRE Attack Frameworks uh, site. So um, you know, do with that what you wish. Uh, but then crash override. So crash override, uh, again, in tandem with Black Energy 3, because again, it was Russia attacking Ukraine, uh, crash override almost one year to the date, uh, which has got to make for a frustrating year. Oh, yes, this. Uh, I always appreciate when people point out the obvious to me, because, you know, what's obvious to one person isn't always obvious to another person. And I've actually been asked this question, what is the difference between crash override and in destroyer? They mean the same thing. Uh, they're just the, the same event with two different names by two different organizations. Dragos uh, coined this crash override, ESET um, out of Slovakia uh, coined this in destroyer. But for the most part, they're the same thing. So, so please don't let someone trip you up with that. But yes, uh, crash override took place in 2016. Again, the likely intent was to turn out the lights, target country Ukraine. The difference uh, with crash override uh, than Black Energy is the target here was actually transmission 
um, transmission utilities, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but that's, that's a big difference that I like to harp on. Uh, and another big difference is crash override actually included the ICS modules uh, to enumerate and infiltrate and make manipulations to the system on its own. So it didn't necessarily need that attacker remote access to come in uh, and make changes and execute the attack. It's, it's a, considered a malware framework uh, and I've highlighted some of the uh, um, communication protocols that were included with, with the malware. Uh, but something that is really great that's highlighted well in industry and in a lot of these papers and talks is that it would be very easy to include other protocols into the malware framework. And one such protocol that gets referenced a lot is DNP3, uh, which, which would make uh, crash override a little bit more uh, applicable to North America's grid. Uh, and I don't think it should stop there either, right? DMP3, Modbus, 2030.5. Uh, I'm listing some IEEE standards. Uh, but yeah, so uh, just something uh, relevant. You know, if somebody says, like, oh, crash override, that was only in Europe, uh, it, it could be applicable here in North America mm -hmm. if somebody, I guess, took the time. Uh, there was a vulnerability found uh, with with the malware that I, I, I want to point out here that didn't actually uh, take effect per se from what I understand. Uh, but what they found was that uh, Black Enter, or excuse me, Crash Override was able to put uh, some of the Siemens Cipratec relays into a firmware update state uh, that made the relays look like they were operational, but in fact were not operational. They were actually waiting for a firmware update. Uh, and if you, it, well, I guess I didn't mention this, but what with Black Energy 3 and Crash Override, one of the things that was discovered was that Ukraine's uh, electrical grid uh, is has a lot of legacy equipment and a lot of engineers who know how to do manual overrides. And uh, that really um, helped in its ability to come back online so quickly um, versus you know a more digital or automated uh, grid, maybe like we have here in North America. And so if you think about it with these relays looking like they're functioning uh, and a bunch of engineers manually putting the system back online, thinking, oh, I've got protection down the line because that PLC is working, that could create a lot of damage um, if, uh, if, if it really had worked the way that it was intended. Thankfully, it didn't work that way. Uh, but I, I want to bring this up because these are the types of things that engineers need to be watching out for, right? This, this in-between firmware update state that people probably see every day with like, oh, that's just the way it works. Don't worry about it. You know, these are the things that attackers are really going to harp on and, and pounce on as an opportunity. So just wanted to bring that up. Uh, again, Russia, Sandworm. Uh, there's a book by Andy Green Greenberg called Sandworm. That's just an incredible read. And so I got a lot of information from that. And I just wanted to give kudos. So again, TTPs. Um, oh, the, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Black Energy 3 looked at the distribution system and Crash Override was focused on the transmission system. And that's a big distinction here. I really, I really, the intent of this slide deck and this presentation is to really line these events up next to one another and be able to tell, you know, what, what one uh, event targeted and what the other one targeted and, you know, kind of pick and choose, you know, what applies to you. So hopefully this helps. Um, I'd love to talk more about this, uh, but um, yeah, if you have any questions, please hit me up. Also, I think it's good to put into perspective, you know, these events compared to some other ones. So I spoke a little bit about the 2003 North American power outage, affected about 55 million people, 23,000 uh, megawatts lost, lasted four days. If you think about this year uh, with the 2021 Texas energy crisis, affected about 5 million people, lasted three days. Uh, Black Energy 3 and Crash Override lasted six hours and one hour, respectively. Uh, I'm not trying to downplay these events. I just want to put in uh, perspective, you know, the doom and gloom uh, uh, perspective that a lot of people can have when it comes to these sorts of things. So, you know, we're still battling mother nature and physics and time and all those things. And uh, these events, you know, don't necessarily compare, but I think the potential is there and people can see, you know, the, the capabilities. And this brings me to Triton. Triton is really well talked about uh, because it, it, it focused on the safety uh, system of a site. 
And that's important because when you when you talk about these other events, you know, uh, breaking a process, turning out the lights, espionage, you know, the, the damage is pretty menial. I, I, I would assume the people in Ukraine might feel differently. But with Triton here, the intent of the malware was actually focused on the safety instrument systems that controlled uh, the hydrogen sulfide levels at a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia. And that's a big deal because, um, you know, that hydrogen sulfide is, is nasty, hazardous stuff, toxic, flammable. Uh, you don't want it getting released out into the air. And so the fact that this malware was trying to actually, you know, possibly create an environment like that where this gas is, is leaking uh, is really scary and upsetting to think that somebody would focus on that. So that's why Triton gets a lot of, of uh, attention. It, it was a malware that was focused on a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia in 2017. Um, it gets its name from the Schneider Electric Triconics controllers uh, that were used um, at that site uh, that, that controlled the hydrogen sulfide levels. Uh, one, one really interesting note, and I know I'm speeding it through here, is that uh, the malware was actually written with Python. And I thought that was really interesting because you don't necessarily hear Python mentioned all that often. Um, and uh, I, it just really stood out to me. It was, it was Python compiled for Windows machines. So clearly these people kind of knew what they were working with um, and, uh, and, and were able to get these, this malware from engineering workstations uh, to the Triconics controllers. Uh, and then what actually ended up giving them away is the Triconics controllers managed to malfunction and shut down the plant. Uh, and so no damage was actually done um, however, the potential is, is certainly there. Again, attributed to Russia uh, and this research institute. Um, and that's pretty much all I'll say about that. Oop. Uh, TTPs, much more elaborate. Um, I, I just, I can't, I can't recommend enough going to MITRE ATT&CK's uh, uh, website and looking these up and looking up the, the mitigations. Uh, it's it's just a, a wonderful resource for learning uh, and something I'm you know trying to learn myself. <laughs> so here's the scorecard laid out. Uh, I said at this at the beginning of the presentation. I really wanted to put these events together side by side so you could look and say, oh, who were the players? Well, you know, what were the technologies? You know, this, that, and the other. Uh, what were the years? So I, I hope this is a tool that you can use uh, at least be a quick reference. Um, I would love to know additions if, if somebody's got some good suggestions. So please, again, hit me up um, and, and let me know what you think of this. And then my takeaways. So I only have three real takeaways. I tried to highlight some pieces throughout that I would love for engineers to, to take away from this presentation and, and be cognizant of. Uh, but these three takeaways are the ones I wanted to leave you with. Uh, the first one is... Um, ICS cybersecurity is extremely fascinating. Uh, I'm a hobbyist, I'm an enthusiast. I think there's a lot of people like me. There's multiple different avenues for entry, you know, whether you're a programmer or a cybersecurity or electrical engineer or whatever. So I think there's a lot to be learned here and a lot of places where you could say, oh, I, I think that's interesting. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that or that relates to me. So uh, second um, is that these events together create just an incredible list laundry list of use cases and examples um, and things to be learned and, and applied to your industry or, you know, somebody else, you know, industry. So, um, you know, these events are not all the same. Um, they are not all just ICS events, right? They, they are all unique and there's a lot to be learned. Uh, and I think stacked up together, uh, they, they make for an interesting uh, learn. And then lastly, uh, our infrastructure is incredibly fragile. We're battling physics, environment, time, uh, and cyber threats is a, is a new threat vector that we have to take into account. Uh, and so um, I just wanted to kind of leave people with, you know, we, it needs to be taken seriously and it needs to be expected. And with that, I just want to thank uh, GrimCon again so much for this opportunity. I want to thank Ron Bash uh, for mentoring me with this. Uh, he had some wonderful feedback. Also, Don Weber, who I reached out to, uh, provided a lot of feedback, and I really appreciate that. Please check out these links. Hit me up if you have any questions. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Have a great day to the conference. All right. I'm going to leave... Uh... I'm going to leave this slide up just for a little bit so anybody can... Uh... Hit him up.
maybe possibly uh, actually scan that QR code. I know I'm not going to, but uh, anybody <laughs> else? Who's feeling ballsy? Someone do us do it and let us know what happens because I'm too paranoid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's totally trustworthy. I'm sure. Oh, is there 30 more seconds? No, no. There's one second. Did it, did it stop 30 seconds late? Let's see. What? Awesome. What's interesting? Oh, you're muted again. So when I press play on this, it mutes you. It doesn't allow me to skip through the actual video. Quit doing that. <laughs> Wait, I is would like, if I... Silence, woman. This is my show now. It ended at 2936. Oh, the QR code is his Google Slides. Do you trust him? He's he's technically not in cybersecurity, so it's probably more trustworthy, but I, I don't trust QR codes. Go, this just brings me to COVID and trusting QR codes everywhere. It was a scary, it's a scary time. <laughs> I let my wife scan before I did. Scan the QR code to see our menu. You have no idea how much I qualmed with that, and I was just like, I had to start looking at menus ahead of time because I was just like, please give me a paper one. Like I'm not scanning your random QR code. No. All right. Who's got some questions for Jason? Honestly, that was an awesome talk. Jason, I wish you were in the chat. You seem like a very good presenter and a very- He's in the chat. He's in. Well, I meant, I meant the video chat, not uh, just, I meant in here, not You wish you would be presenting live. <laughs> uh, but that was, oh, well, Okay, let's see. Do, 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 do. do you have jam packed? So much value. He talks quickly like me. He's like, oh god, I can see that I'm getting low on time, but I have a lot of information I want to impart onto you. So let's go, 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 go. Ooh. There you go. I entered you into panelists. So if you have a mic and a camera, you could you can talk. Wait is all about that outsourcing life. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna close the video. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Okay. I can't see you guys. I wasn't expecting to do this, so ah. I'm not properly dressed or placed. <laughs> uh, I yeah, thanks. I got to figure out how to get rid of the actual video when I try to quit it. It doesn't go. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, the last, the last 30 seconds. Uh, it was more or less just me thanking GrimCon, um, everybody who listened to me babble, and um, and then also Ron Brash, who uh, mentored me. He had a lot of good feedback. He's a great resource. He like studied a lot of these things, so it was really great to get his perspective. Um, I'm actually really curious what Vivek th thought. Um, kind of wish my presentation was before his. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I will say that uh, I recorded this thing like four times. And like the first two times it came in at like 50 minutes, 47 minutes. So yeah, there's a lot of extra information in here that I was trying to cram in. But no, that was <laughs> perfect for your first talk. That was really good. I, I saw the time and you're like 30 seconds under. I'm like, oh, he's got it. He's got it good. But for someone who isn't even in the field, that was excellent. Like, Thanks. just to say it again, that almost reminded me like the Dark Neck Diaries readings, right? It yeah. was enough to where anyone who's cybersecurity is really gonna appreciate it and enough for anybody to be able to understand it and go further, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that because that's kind of the, the middle ground I was targeting. Um, I'd love to do a more technical deep dive. Obviously that would require a lot more of myself and. I still wanted it to be like entry level enough where like, like I say, you could share this to like your electrical engineering friend and be like, look, this is why these things are important. Like, here's, here's, here's what I mean whenever I reference Stuxnet and they might say, oh, I get it now. So. No, oh, you did awesome. Wow. You did better than me on my first talk. So. <laughs>
I wasn't um, privy to Wade's first talk, so uh, I can't comment. But no, I, I definitely like was very sucked in and. Uh, cool. Very cool. It's definitely some yeah, cool I, information. Thanks. Yeah, and, and my links there, I actually uh, share all my resources, all my citations, and even some like longer write ups. Um, uh, so. Um, you know, if, if if you do, if you're looking for a place to like dive more in, it's it's all there, and uh, yeah, it's it's fun stuff. <laughs> it looks fun. I've never really had had everything broken apart like that. Like I've always like, oh, I understood that it went after this, and it made this do that, and but it's like you know, you never know why or how, and like I would I would love personally to know a lot more about that side of things. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, ICS, I think, is really different than a lot of the other cybersecurity uh, facets. Um, you know, one of the main things, and I'd love to hear about X take on this, but you know, when, when you get down to the PLCs and the RTUs, um, you're talking about like a lot of proprietary systems, a lot of um, rudimentary uh, systems. You know, one of the big things they talk about with ICS pen testing and stuff is like, you can't just do a normal scan because you'll take everything offline and then you'll shut down a plan and then ruin everyone's day. <laughs> and, I've heard some uh, stories about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so, like, I really appreciate those things that 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 sensitivity and that challenge, um, and just all those, uh, you know, like I say, pri pri proprietary technologies and stuff. Uh, it's what I studied in college. So, um, I don't know. I hope other people get excited about it. I hope it doesn't scare other people. I hope other people look for ICS opportunities because I think there's a lot out there. And, you there's know, there's there's, professionals. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely so much in ICS and ICS is one of those things that it's so hard to do because everyone's doing it different there is no standardization there is no uniform standard there is no gold standard like it it's so hard yeah what are yeah. what are some of the training resources really for ICS like I don't even know yeah so CISA has some free training the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency um, that I know of uh, obviously, SANS has a ICS uh, course. Um, I've heard of some other things. I think uh, some of the national labs, like Idaho National yeah. Labs, but I'm not. I'm not sure if those are public or not. Um, they I'll aren't. A little bit more. <laughs> I, I've heard of Idaho Labs and what they've did there, but I've uh, to all to like give me a little background. I've also worked in the power industry for a little bit, and oh, okay. so I. They flirted with sending me to the Idaho Labs testing thing, but I heard all gotcha. that, and it sounded super cool, but I never got to go. Ah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not in this space, so like I, I don't really have the capacity to justify going uh, with my current employer, but um, I have heard of people mention it, and it sounds like it's really good. And, um, uh, but there is a lot of of freely available stuff too, which is where I got all my information. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. It's out there if you want to find it.